Good evening. I'm David Gergen, and I'm delighted to uh, jo welcome you here to this, the most prestigious forum at Harvard. And we have a prestigious guest uh, tonight. I'm here on behalf of the Institute of Politics, uh, as well as the Center for Public Leadership th that I co-direct uh, to welcome you. I, uh, we're blessed in the midst with this campaign coming down the home stretch. There is so much um, focus now, not only on politics, but on the intersection of politics and the media, and we couldn't be in a better place to have a conversation with someone who would enjoy your hardballs, not just your softballs, but can hit a hardball right over the fence. So know that, uh, that our guest tonight is, uh, is anxious and eager to hear your questions uh, and to respond. Uh, we have Lois Romano is going to be our moderator for the evening. Uh, she is, uh, was with the Washington Post for a quarter of a century uh, then uh, a quarter of a century, it's unbelievable. And we, we, and, I, we and I have been down many roads, to, well, we've been down many roads together. I greeted her when she was a child in, the, in the Washington. The, um, uh, but she was here uh, at the Institute of Politics as a fellow, uh, and she's now back with the Washington Post writing up, and she does a lot of me uh, profiles online of uh, influential voices in the Obama administration. She's a first-class journalist, no one better to uh, ask the questions uh, tonight. Uh, our, ma our, our major speaker is Jeff Zucker. Uh, he has a, a legend in the television industry. Uh, he's a man who came at the age of 26 uh, to produce the Today Show, uh, overhauled it, made it much more popular, went on to a quarter century uh, at NBC where he held all the top positions. Uh, ran NBC overall uh, f uh, for a while, and in 2013 came to CNN uh, to be in charge of all of CNN's news operations, international as well as domestic, and there are many far-flung operations. When he got there, I, I, and full disclosure, I have a, I'm, I'm a, one of the contributors to CNN, I'm paid by CNN, so I'm a little careful by what I say. Uh, I, I cannot afford to be quite as outspoken as Mr. Zucker. The, uh, but nonetheless, I, I, here's a couple of things you should know. Uh, when he came in, in 2013, CNN was running third among the cable uh, folks. Uh, and the, frankly, as, uh, there, were, uh, there were a lot of very, very good people at CNN at the time, but there was a lot of demoralization also that was occurring. People weren't sure what the future of CNN. We got banged more than we deserved. Uh, out in the uh, in the press, in the written press. Uh, and in the three years, look from where CNN is today. CNN has, it's now th started in 1980, it's 36 years old. It's had the greatest audience this year of any year in its history. It is closer to Fox than at any time in the last 15 years. And it has the biggest lead over MSNBC the biggest lead in 13 years. All of that comes because Jeff really invested in his political coverage. He put a lot of chips on the table. He saw this storm coming long before it got here, understood it would be a dramatic story, invested in it, and the results now are there. In addition, he's trying to, what he calls future-proof CNN, and that is by bringing it into the digital age. CNN, under his leadership, has invested tens of millions of dollars into the digital world. Uh, recently, they've hired 200 uh, people on staff for the digital side. Get your resumes out, uh, and it's still flowing. Uh, and in addition to that, we're in the midst of a year when there are a lot of questions, of course, about television coverage, about the role of the media. Did it do it right? Did it do it wrong? What is it, did it enable Trump? Is it pulling him down? Is it fair? All those kind of questions are out there, and the floor is open to that. But I just want to close with one to personalize this a lot and what CNN has become. About two years ago, I got a telephone call from Donnie Graham, who had been the publisher of the Washington Post. And he said, you know, we have a young man who came up, came up an African-American, who grew up in poverty in Washington. We got him on one of our scholarship programs in high school. His name is Eugene Scott. He's worked his way up as a newspaper reporter out in the West. He's still not where he wants to be. He wants to go to the Kennedy School. Would you look after him? And Eugene came here. He scraped up the money from a lot of sources. When he left here a year, two years ago, he got a, uh, he got a job at CNN as a writer. He's been writing up a storm as a reporter. He's now an on-air 
an analyst for CNN. That's the jobs that Jeff has opened up for a lot of young people for a chance to give, give them a chance to, to star have really been a remarkable part of the story as well. So Lois, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Jeff, thank you for coming. Jeff, thanks a lot for doing this again. Um, and I, uh, you've had a great run, and you've had a great year, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, but before we do, I think we need to talk about the elephant in the room, and that's Donald Trump. So I'm gonna start there, um, and to just sort of- I'm, I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's not really original, but- No, no, no. <laughs> to, to kind of bounce off what, what David said, you know, no, no small amount of research and punditry uh, is being done right now you know, exploring the role the media has had in the creation of Donald Trump. I mean, some estimate that, that the media has given him up to $2 billion of free media. Um, so walk us through your thinking last year when, when Donald Trump first announced where he was nowhere in the polls, where he had no policy experience, where he hadn't raised a dime, um, and CNN went all in. Tell us a little bit about the thought process on that. Is that me or you? That was me. Okay. <laughs> So, um, yeah, look, I think that, uh, I, think that I, I have had a unique relationship with Donald Trump. I, I will acknowledge that uh, I, uh, I was also the one who put The Apprentice on the air at NBC. So I, I had, uh, you know, I've known who he is and what he is for a long time. And I actually didn't think he was going to run for president. Uh, and, uh, and I had told my my team actually, you know, that we didn't need to cover Donald Trump uh, unless he announced. You know, there was always this flirtation and people always wondered, you know, was he gonna run? And I had said we shouldn't cover him unless he announces. Then he announced in that famous, uh, you know, uh, ride down the elevator and, and the speech he gave at, at Trump Tower. And I, I think that, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that, the, that we did at CNN uh, and that we were, I think one of the things is we recognized much earlier than most that there was a little bit of a phenomenon uh, to Donald Trump. And uh, we recognized that there was something going on with him. And as a result, we did, uh, we did give him uh, uh, quite a bit of coverage. Um, now, in his defense and in our defense, when we asked him for an interview, he said yes. And I cannot say that about the other, Republican, uh, uh, the other Republicans who were running um, for president. And I never felt that he should be penalized or, or CNN should be penalized for the fact that he said yes and they said no. You know, Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush went two months without agreeing to do an interview. That is not Donald Trump's fault and that's not CNN's fault. That's their fault. So, you know, I think we recognized early on that there was uh, something going on. Uh, he agreed to interviews. His competitors, by and large, did not. Uh, and I will say if, if we made any mistake last year, and I've said this before, so, so um, this is not breaking news, uh, I, I'd say that if we made a mistake last year, it's that uh, we probably did put on too many of his uh, campaign rallies in the, in those early months, uh, un, you know, unedited and, and just let them run, you know, listen, because you never knew what he was gonna say, you never knew what was gonna happen, so there was, there was an attraction to put those on the air, and I think in hindsight, we probably shouldn't have done that as much. However, I do not believe, and I totally reject the idea that that's how he got the Republican nomination. I don't think that that putting on uh, his campaign rallies uh, was what drove him to the Republican nomination. So I think, I think we shouldn't have done that, and I've acknowledged that before, I'd say it here again, and I, and I don't, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, open and candid about that, but I don't think that that's why he got the Republican nomination. Well, I can't address the stuff about the interviews because I don't know if they were saying no, although they dispute that, they, some of them do anyway. Well, they're not, they're, then they're not telling the truth. But, but you know, if you go back to the rallies, let me ask you a question. Did you put the rallies on because they were of news value or because they were driving ratings? Well, uh, 
<laughs> Come on, let's make a little news here. No, 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 no. Listen, we put them on because you never knew what he was going to say, right? You never knew what was going to happen at those rallies. Now, they did also attract quite a bit of an audience. That is true. So, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't a mandate that said, hey, put that on because it's going to get the rating. It was much more, hey, we should cover that because who knows what he's going to do this time or who knows what he's going to say. Now, the fact that they'd also attracted audiences and ratings, uh, you know, certainly uh, didn't hurt uh, the thinking. So, so doesn't that make it more entertainment than news? I mean, wasn't he sort of creating his own reality show? And the, and the cable networks were letting him do that? Well, I mean, you know, the news business covers what's new. And, uh, and every, uh, you know, every time he would, he would go out to do a rally, there was something new. And so, you know, I think that, you know, you can call it entertainment, you can call it a reality show, um, but there was news in it, you know, almost every time. Did you ever think he'd end up as a nominee? Um, did, uh, I, I think we thought early on he had a much better shot than others did. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, you know, I think that that is why, you know, we, we gave it a little bit more attention than I think uh, certainly the, the print media did. Uh, I think the print media was slow mm -hmm. to uh, understand what was going on with Trump. Um, and I think, uh, um, and I think we, we had, we had a, a sense that it was possible much sooner than others, yes. So given where we are now, given where the country is and, and where this campaign has dropped to, um, what are your regrets? No, I, I, I sleep great. Um, <laughs> no. I mean, listen, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's our role or my role to have regrets. You know, 14 million uh, voters voted for Donald Trump in the Republican primaries. And so they made their choice. And, uh, and I don't think it's our role to pass judgment on, on the decision that the party made. You know, in all of our coverage, I said to you, the only, uh, you know, listen, listen, we, we, I make plenty of mistakes. Uh, but I think the, if I had to look back at, at the totality of our coverage over the last 18 months, and I am unbelievably proud of the job that CNN has done, and I feel really, really proud uh, of our coverage. If we made a mistake, the, 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 the mistake, and I've said this before, was we shouldn't have put on as many of those rallies early on. Beyond that, I don't, I don't have any regrets. Um, so you um, created The Apprentice. Well, I didn't create it, but I, I put it on NBC. Okay. Mark Burnett created the, the show. Okay, and it's been, it was a phenomenal success. It was a huge, phenomenal success for NBC, yeah. So, uh, and you know Trump. I do know Trump. Okay, so tell us a little bit about Trump. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it, I, I'll tell you the story about why I wanted The Apprentice, because sure. I think it goes to that, which is I was running NBC Entertainment in uh, 2003, uh, somewhere in there, and uh, Survivor had been the big uh, uh, reality hit show at CBS. And everybody uh, in, in entertainment in LA was looking for the next Survivor. And Survivor had been created by Mark Burnett. Uh, and NBC needed a, a, a reality hit as well. Mark Burnett came out with uh, a new pitch uh, that was basically Survivor in a different jungle, right? It was the jungle of the boardroom. And, uh, and I was running NBC Entertainment and, you know, the other folks who were running the entertainment divisions in Los Angeles were all from LA. I was the one who was from New York. And, and, and Burnett was pitching uh, The Apprentice as you know, survivor in a different jungle with this guy, Donald Trump. And being from New York, I understood what a publicity magnet Donald Trump was. So my thinking was I wanted to buy The Apprentice and put it on because I knew if nothing else, it would generate a tremendous amount of publicity. Because when you came out of New York, uh, especially in that era, you knew that he was the front page of the tabloids all the time. He, he generated a disproportionate amount of attention. And I thought that that would be good for you know, a, a new show that needed publicity. That's why I wanted to buy it. One, we needed a hit. Mark Burnett had a good track record. It was a good pitch. And I knew Donald Trump was a PR machine. 
And so uh, that's, uh, you know, that is why I bought The Apprentice. It turned out to be right. It turned out to be a huge phenomenon. And you know, uh, Trump uh, uh, delivered on PR. Uh, he delivered on big ratings. You know, he would always claim the ratings were bigger than they were, but that was okay. Um, <laughs> He's still doing that. Well, okay. You know, uh, some things stay the same. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then, and then a, a story that I, I uh, recall is that after um, the first season of The Apprentice, when it was a huge runaway success, Trump, uh, Trump wanted to renegotiate his contract uh, with us, and uh, Burnett asked me to do it with Trump, uh, and Trump came in and said that he wanted to be paid like the cast of Friends. And at that time, the cast of Friends, was, they were each earning a million dollars an episode. And so he wanted to be paid like the cast of Friends. I said, well, Donald, you're not going to get a million dollars an episode. And he said, well, I, I mean all six uh, cast members. <laughs> so he said he wanted six million dollars an episode. I said, well, you're not going to get six million, and you're not going to get a million, but, you know. Uh, and so we actually had lunch. We talked about it. Uh, this was huge. This was burnishing his brand, the Trump mm -hmm. brand. So it was all good for him. He was making about, you know, around $40,000 an episode at the time. Uh, you know, he, he wanted these millions. Uh, I think we offered him a raise to about, you know, 60K an episode. He didn't want it. So I said, okay, then we'll go get somebody else to do it. Uh, we parted ways. And the next day his lawyer called and said, okay, we'll take it. So. <laughs> he wasn't going to give up that. So, so just to go back to my question, um, can you talk about him a little bit personally? Oh, yeah. We're, so, not, we're not seeing a great picture of him right now. Yeah. So look, I mean, uh, you know, the Trump that I've always known is somebody who's a publicity uh, magnet, there's no doubt, uh, uh, and somebody who over, always understood the media, how to use the media. I think that's been clear. Um, uh, you know, I will say that uh, what is out there now and, and the allegations that are out there now, I am unaware of any of that. Uh, I never uh, knew of any of that, never heard of any of that. Um, that was certainly not in the context in the way that I knew him. The way I knew him was as somebody who, you know, uh, loved to brag about his ratings, who loved, to, loved the media spotlight, um, and knew how to uh, draw attention uh, to himself and to his program. And that was the context in which I always knew him. Have you, have you now that you've seen all this stuff come out, have you changed your view of him a little bit? Well, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to talk about okay. my personal views of either candidate because mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's fair uh, to our coverage to do that. Okay. Um, let, me, let me ask you about the tone of the coverage in general. Um, the Shorenstein Center here has done a study uh, mostly about the primaries and, um, and a little bit going into the general. And, and their conclusion was that um, the bar was a lot lower for, for Trump in the sense that you know, 50, 60 percent of his coverage was the horse race, not a whole lot on issues, very small percent on issues. Uh, Hillary's coverage was much more negative generally in the media. Um, uh, the bar was much higher for her, much more focused on issues. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, did he yeah, get a break? I mean, break? I haven't seen that study. I, I, I don't really agree with that. I really don't. Because um, uh, I can only speak to, uh, you know, again, he was doing interviews with us all the time. Right. right. I mean, he was more available than certainly any of his competitors. Mm -hmm. He was far more available than uh, Hillary Clinton was. Uh, you know, uh, so he was, he was doing interviews all the time. Uh, and those interviews were largely uh, issues oriented uh, and talking about uh, his, his view on the issues. You know, and, and so I really reject this idea when people say, you know, he wasn't asked about his views on things. Now, his views on things may have changed from interview to interview, uh, but he was asked about them all the time, and that's what those interviews were. So this idea that he wasn't pushed uh, on his, his, uh, his view of things, I, I really reject, uh, certainly in, in thinking about you know, all the times he was or on criticized CNN. or challenged, you know, I mean. Yeah, was, all of okay. the above. I mean, okay. I, I really reject that. I mean, I think about the interviews that Anderson Cooper did and that, and that uh, Jake Tapper did and that Chris Cuomo did and that Allison Camerata did uh, on, on CNN uh, and Wolf Witzer. No, 
he was challenged on, on all of these issues. And, uh, and, and so I, I just, I really don't agree with that. Okay. Um, right now, there's no issues being discussed. That's true. <laughs> as, as, as my colleague Dan Balls wrote this morning, the issues have been reduced to asterisks, yeah. um, which is really um, a sad state of affairs. But let's pivot because I know um, this audience is going to yeah. please. I would just say, I mean, I do think that this, this now has come down to fitness to be president between the two of them and not about issues. And do you think Donald Trump is fit to be president? Again, I'm not going to answer those questions. <laughs> that's, for, that's for others to answer. Um, but fair. it's a good try. <laughs> I'll just keep trying to get there. All right, let's pivot a little bit because I know our audience will have a lot more uh, questions for you on, on the coverage. Um, so CNN has had a remarkable comeback. Wait, we're getting off Trump? Yeah, we are. We uh, are. Yeah, it's, it's 20 minutes. Oh, okay. 22 minutes on Trump. Okay. Um, uh, but all of you, please save your questions on Trump. We're not totally done. Um, CNN has had a remarkable comeback, and not just because of Donald Trump. Um, uh, when you took over, morale was low, there were layoffs, uh, and the network, the future of the network was in jeopardy. Ratings were bad. Now, as you, as David and you say, it's the most watched after Fox. Um, the comm scores came out today. Your, your website is up there again. Tell us a little bit about what your strategy was to bring it back, um, but also include what worked and what didn't work. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think that paints a, a slightly bleaker picture than it was. I mean, uh, in fairness to where CNN was. Um, but there's no doubt we, we've made a, a, a lot of progress and the last few years have been uh, uh, very exciting and very successful for us. I think our, our, our strategy, uh, we've had three pillars to our strategy. One was um, we decided to go all in on the big news story of the time. And, um, my thinking on that was everybody in this audience and, and around the country and around the world now gets their headlines and their news on their device that's in their pocket. And so everybody knows what's going on. You're not gonna tune in to CNN to, to see a wheel of the top 10, 12 stories of the day. You've got that on your phone. And so our strategy became, you know, whatever the big story is, we're gonna go all in. And we're gonna smother that story whatever it is. Now, one of the first stories that we did that on uh, that I got a lot of criticism for uh, was the coverage of the mis m missing Malaysian airliner. Right. And um, I hear murmurs in the crowd. <laughs> and, um, and I understand that, that's fine. But I think what, what uh, part of the reason that w we got a lot of criticism for it was that we hadn't done that before in any significant way and people weren't used to what was CNN doing. Right now, we were also there was one other big that was about a five or six week stretch where we were pretty much all in on that story. There was one other story going on at the time, which was uh, um, cruise the cruise ship. No, well, no, the cruise ship preceded that. Oh, okay, yeah, there was the poop cruise. Yes, poop we did cruise. that too. <laughs> we did that too. That was probably the first thing we did, but that only lasted that only lasted about forty eight hours. Okay. But I took a lot of heat for that too. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, that actually was the first, and then, and then this was and the next. Late. But while the missing uh, airliner was going on, there was also the uh, Russian invasion into, into Crimea. Oh, right. Uh, or mm. into Ukraine at that mm. time. And we covered that more extensively than any other television outlet there was. We had four reporters on the ground in Ukraine. Now, we were covering both. Now, obviously, uh, uh, the airliner had far more coverage than Ukraine. I'm not trying to pretend otherwise. But, the, but our coverage of Ukraine wouldn't have been any greater if we were doing something else. But nobody wanted to actually give us credit for the fact that we were also covering Ukraine. They only wanted to slam us for putting so much attention on the plane. Well, the fact is, that was the strategy. That if we made people, this is what people were interested in. If we made those people watch a little bit longer, then the ratings would continue to increase. That is, that is true. And we were still covering every story out there on our digital platforms. So we were not covering any less news, we were just putting it in different places. And I think this was a strategic change that most people didn't recognize early on. And so we have followed that philosophy now through the political campaign is the, is the latest example of that, but you know, whether it's the bombings in Paris or Istanbul or San Bernardino or Orlando, or whether it's war in Gaza or, or, or you know, invasion of Crimea, whatever it is, we go all in on that story and we stay with it. And 
you know, that has been a very successful strategy and that has worked. That was the one, that was the most significant change. The second change in our strategy was we introduced uh, series programming, what we call original programming to the network. The most well known of this is things like Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown. Uh, and so, you know, the old criticism of CNN was that you only, it was like a spare tire. You only took it out of the trunk when you needed it, right? So you only turned on CNN when something was going on. We wanted to come up with something that uh, gave people a reason to come to CNN when there wasn't news. And, uh, and Anthony Bourdain was greenlit just before I got to CNN. I had the good sense to keep it alive. And, uh, and now this year we have 12 original series. When I got there we had zero. And those series have worked and have really helped. And then the third part of our strategy is going all in on digital. And we've invested heavily in digital. Uh, we are the number one source of news and information of any digital platform in the world. We are the number one source of political news uh, uh, now for something like 16 months in a row ahead of the Washington Post, the New York Times, Politico, whoever, whoever you want, 16 months in a row. And so we invested heavily in that early on. So going all in on the big story, original series and digital have been the real cornerstones of our turnaround. Um, and the digital is part of uh, future proofing, as you say. That's, right. You guys were a little bit behind on that, as was the Washington Post. We were all a little behind. Um, so, uh, one of the areas that we're all, every news organization is trying to get to, and, and you guys have had an improvement, but you're still sort of down there, is, is, is the millennials. Well, you know, I mean, the fact is, uh, listen, um, we actually are, are, are doing pretty well in terms of a younger 18 to 34 audience mostly because of our digital strength. You know, a lot of people, a lot of 18 to 34 year olds know us. They don't even know that we're a television network. They know that, we're, we, that they can get their information from CNN on their digital device. When there's a big story, our, our 18 to 34 numbers spike and we think it's because they know us from this digital space and then they come over to television. Listen, there's no doubt that, that traditional news organizations uh, uh, have wanted to chase millennials. But you know, there's all this attention on outlets like, you know, uh, Vox and Mike and Buzzfeed and Vice. You know who has, who has more millennials than any of those organizations? CNN. Is that right? Yeah. So we, you know, we, and those are all good organizations, but we have a larger, uh, we have more millennials uh, getting their news and information from CNN than any of those organizations. Well, since you mentioned BuzzFeed, you sort of dismissed them um, and said they weren't serious, I guess, a few weeks ago. And then um, you hired their entire research staff. So tell us a, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that thinking. You know, um, I, I was trying to draw them into a false sense of security uh, before we went in and, and to, look. And raided them. <laughs> yeah, look. what. Um, you know, listen, BuzzFeed was taking a lot of shots at, at uh, us and me this year for our yeah. Trump coverage, right? So, you know, I just felt like punching them back one day. And, yeah, um, fair enough. <laughs> and so I took a shot at them, and, you know, it's all, all in good fun. Um, I, said, uh, I said that they weren't a, a real news organization. Okay, they're a real news organization. There, now I've said it, okay? Um, uh, in the meantime, we did hire uh, four of their uh, top... Uh, news journalists and uh, who are making a huge difference already yeah, at CNN and good. it's been great and I think it's just another sign of the fact that folks want to come uh, be part of the CNN organization. So um, Fox, how come you haven't been able to bypass them? What well, are they doing? <laughs> well, Fox News. Yeah. yeah. Fox News. Um, well look, I mean, uh, as David mentioned earlier, uh, CNN this year uh, in total viewers, this is the closest we've been to, to Fox News in total viewers in eight years, and the closest we've been to Fox News in adults 25 to 54, which is how we mm -hmm. sell our business in 15 years, okay? So we, we've made tremendous uh, strides on Fox. In prime time, uh, we're within two share points of right? Fox in adults 25 to 54, again, how we sell the business. Uh, they have 34% of the prime time audience. We have 32% of the prime time audience. Uh, so we're right on their heels uh, this year. Now, look, Fox, I, I, I think it's going to be 
very hard for us to ever, ever is a long time, but I think it's going to be very hard for us to overtake Fox News in terms of total audience because, quite frankly, their audience has a lot of people over the age of 70, uh, and it's just very old, and frankly, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not chasing those viewers. Um, you know, uh, people have referred to, well, I'm not even going to say that because I'll just get them in trouble, but um, uh, uh, Barbara, I don't know where Barbara is, you're welcome, I didn't say that. Uh, uh, you know, I just think that they have a much older audience uh, that, that is, you know, uh, male, white, and over the age of 70, and we're just not going to be able to compete with that. So, so that's a good segue into the future. Um, the, your audience, according to Pew and others, is 61? I think the average age of our audience... TV audience. Of our TV yeah. audience is, uh, it's either 60 or 61, yeah. So, so what happens after this year? I mean, you have laid the groundwork, yeah. but you have said yourself that, you know, the ratings are not going to hold up next They're year. They're not. Our ratings next year will not be what they are this year. So, so what's the next... Our audience. I mean, is cable TV going to be dead and, no. and it's all mobile and digital? Well, no. What happens now? So, look, I mean, part of it is I do think that that's why we've tried to future-proof ourselves going forward in, in, in investing so heavily in digital. And so I think we, we are, are well set there. But I don't think cable news is dead. I think that's what people always want to write that story. And, you know, uh, uh, that's just not true at all. Our audience levels will not be next year what they are this year. But I think that they will actually be significantly above uh, where they were in 2014 and 2015 for two reasons. One, I think we've, uh, we've uh, done a good job in, in you know, right, fixing the brand. And so the brand is much stronger today than it was two or three years ago. I think we have this whole complement of original series uh, that we didn't have a few years ago. Uh, and I think we have uh, a new way of, of approaching the big story that will keep that audience coming uh, for the big story, even though it won't be what this year's big story is. So I, 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 feel, I feel very uh, confident about the next few years for, for CNN. Um, so, so on your digital platform, on your politics site, you, you, you really beef that up. Um, in fact, you hire a lot of people from my former place of employment, Politico. Um, what happens next year when there's no Trump anymore? Yeah, so look, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there's just a different story, but, but politics doesn't recede as a story, okay? And so, whereas maybe in prior years we wouldn't have been as heavily invested in the political story, we will be. Uh, and I think that we will remain the number one source of political news and information. We're not going to give that up. We're going to keep covering the story, whatever it is, you know, uh, you know, Maybe it's Trump, maybe it's not, you know? Uh, I'm not gonna presuppose where the story's going. But uh, even if it's not, uh, I think there will be a fascinating story in Washington and uh, we will be all in on it. Well, either one would be a fascinating story. Right, exactly. So I, I, I think we're well positioned for that. Um, let me all um, ask you now, we can, we can take questions. There's four microphones. You should, um, one, two, I think there's two up there. Um, so if you all want to come to the microphones, um, we can, and I'll, we'll rotate. Um, I would just ask you um, to keep your questions short. Make sure there's a question mark um, at the end of them. And um, no speechifying, please. Um, all right, l I'll, let's start right here. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Kingsbury. I'm an Extension School student. And uh, my question is uh, to you, what is the definition, kind of to follow up uh, on what Lois was saying, what's the definition or differences to you between uh, entertainment, ratings, news, and like uh, journalism of substance? Because, uh, I don't know, it seems like it's a little blurred, not to... Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I think that we're in the news business, but that doesn't need, mean it needs to be boring, okay? So, uh, you know, we are, uh, we are in the business of covering the news, breaking news, covering breaking news, uh, but I think that uh, the definition of news doesn't necessarily mean, have to include 
boring. Now, I'm not saying we're going to, you know, produce a, a reality television or scripted entertainment show to cover it. I think we can present it in, a, uh, in an engaging fashion. Doesn't, that's not an entertaining fashion, but an engaging fashion that's not boring. And so, to me, uh, our job is to cover the news, report the news, and do it in an engaging way. Okay. Great, thank Thanks. you. Uh, Howard Cohen, a CNN alum and a student here at the Harvard Kennedy School. When you look back to your experience uh, here at Harvard, is there a moment or event uh, that helped shape the path that you took and brought you to where you are today? Well, I, I guess I would point to two. Uh, one, you know, I was fortunate enough to be the president of the Harvard Crimson, which was an incredible experience. Uh, and it, it really uh, gave me a tremendous foundation for the journalism that would follow for all the years. And so that, that uh, was an incredible experience for which I'm incredibly grateful. And then the second thing is that um, I didn't get into Harvard Law School, and uh, for that I thank God every day. <laughs> Very good answer. Up there. I don't think this mic, oh, there it is. Um, my name's Jack Mulhern. I'm a tour guide at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. I just have a question. I'm curious to know if you can draw a distinction between the public's right to know versus the public's need to know. For example, during the missile crisis, certain information President Kennedy made sure the newspapers didn't publish until he could negotiate yeah. diplomacy properly. Yeah. Is that still continuing to this day? Yeah, I mean, listen, there are, there are moments of, uh, um, there are times of national security uh, when um, lives could be in danger that we make decisions uh, to hold something or not publish it. Um, we won't do that indefinitely, and we won't do it very often, but, uh, but if you can make the case that um, lives will be in danger because of what we're reporting, uh, we, we will make decisions that, uh, when that can outweigh um, the public's need to know. Yeah. Over here. Hi, um, I'm Teddy, I'm a freshman at the college. Um, so when the Bully Bush tapes come out, Billy Bush tapes came out last week. Um, it was revealed that NBC News had had the tapes for a while and was sitting on them. If and when CNN were to come into contact with similar sort of evidence, what would the process be like and what would cause CNN to potentially not release them? Uh, well, I can't speak to the process that went on uh, at NBC News because I obviously am not privy to that. Uh, but um, uh, my gut would have been to uh, publish that story and put that on the air as soon as we came into uh, contact with it. I think the Washington Post uh, had, it on, uh, had it up six hours after they received it, and, uh, and I think they did a, a fantastic job in reporting it out and deserves a tremendous amount of credit. Uh, and, and I can tell you that, you know, uh, if CNN had come into the same uh, information, uh, I see no reason why we wouldn't have published it uh, as soon as we could verify it and give uh, the Trump campaign an opportunity to respond. Let me ask you a quick follow-up on that. Um, it looks like uh, the Today Show is suspending Billy Bush. Um, if you were uh, doing this, was he complicit? So I think it's a really interesting question. Um, uh, I think what you're really asking me is, should he lose his job? Right. That's, that's what, what you're I'm really asking That's me. what I'm asking you, right? Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, you know, again, I don't know all the facts, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I don't want to uh, be definitive one way or the other because I don't know all the facts. But um, as in looking at it from the outside, I'm not. Uh, listen, by the way, his his language and his his behavior was, uh, you know, boorish and juvenile and silly. Uh, um, you know. Uh, but it was Access Hollywood 11 years ago, or whatever it was, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not excusing uh, what he did um, at all. Uh, but you know, I, I don't know that it's so clear cut that he should lose his job over that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know all the facts, but I, I don't know that it's so clear cut. Okay. Um, are we here? Is that where we are? Okay. 
I am uh, Jonathan Mock. I'm a graduate student in Earth and Planetary Sciences. And my question is, in recent, I guess, to this election, a lot of the panels have campaign surrogates. And you've hired recently Corinne Lewandowski, who's the Trump, uh, Trump campaign manager. And they often tend to dominate the panels. So my question is, uh, what is, what was your thought process in hiring uh, Trump's former campaign manager and surrogates in general? And where do you draw the line for CNN between reporting on the campaign and becoming a mouthpiece for campaigns? Yeah. So uh, that's a good question. Um, so a couple of things. One, uh, we, as part of our strategy in covering the election over the last, uh, probably, you know, for much of the last year, we have used these large panels um, that David Gergen is often a part of. Um, and really, to me, they serve like the Greek chorus, right? And just uh, espousing different points of view. Uh, some of the people on those panels are partisans. Some of those people on those, par uh, on those panels are reporters, and some are just pure analysts. Um, and that's really worked out well for us, and that's been a good formula. Now, with regard to um, hiring surrogates and, uh, uh, and, and where we draw the line, is look, um, I, uh, we have all of the above. We have reporters, we have analysts, and what I wanted also is to have folks who speak uh, on behalf of both the campaigns and or the supporters of those campaigns. And, you know, the Trump, the Trump candidacy provided uh, an interesting issue for us because we had a number of Democratic s surrogates, uh, although on this side there was an issue too, which I'll get to, and on the Republican side, we had more traditional Republican establishment voices. The Trump candidacy is not traditional Republican establishment voices. And so we had to go out and hire a whole different set of Republican voices uh, to, to support the Trump campaign. And especially as it became clear over the last six months that that was gonna be the nominee, that became more important than the Republican establishment voices although both were important because of this tremendous rift that exists within the Republican side. I would say back on the Democratic side, we had to go do the same. We had to go hire voices that supported Bernie Sanders too, which we did not really have uh, on, on staff either. And so there were two different kinds of Democratic surrogate voices over there. Uh, uh, so look, you know, the, the, the Trump surrogate voices, including Corey Lewandowski, who you asked me about, uh, are there to represent those 13 to 14 million voters who have voted for him. Now, I know that there's a lot of people who don't like Corey Lewandowski or the other uh, Trump surrogates that we have on staff. Um, I think a lot of that is because they don't like the idea of the Trump candidacy, and that's just the projection of how could you have those people on the set. Well, we have them on the set, we have them on the set because you know, somebody's got to resent, represent 14 million people who, who voted for, for the guy. I understand that, you know, there are people who might not like that and who might not uh, uh, like those people who are supporting him, but that's what happened. So. All right, thanks. Um, over here. Hi, um, my name is Zhang. I have a question that's, uh, CNN is very high reputation media channel uh, in the U.S. and also around the world. So uh, I, I have a question, like, have you ever faced any challenges during the time you are investigating any political conflict outside of US? Because the other country, they have different political system. Yeah, so, so uh, the question is about, have we ever faced issues outside the United, C CNN is, is a, a truly global network, and uh, you know, there, there, there's, just so everybody knows, there, there's really, there's three global television networks, really, that cover news. CNN, BBC, and Al Jazeera. But Al Jazeera doesn't exist in the United States, so it, it really can't be seen as truly global. And BBC is not that strong in the United States. Uh, and, and so, again, CNN, in my opinion, then becomes the one truly global news network. Have we ever faced issues covering stories outside the United States because of different political systems? Yes, of course we have. I mean, um, you know, there are different, uh, you know, our, our reporters come under uh, tremendous scrutiny and issues uh, in places all over the world. Uh, and we, um, 
Um, and I don't really want to go into naming them uh, case by case here because I don't want to make their jobs harder. But the fact is uh, covering, uh, covering political systems in countries that don't understand the, right, uh, uh, the rights of democracies and the First Amendment makes it much harder in those places and we face issues all the time. And, and it's something that we deal with all the time, that we don't talk about, that we don't, that, that audiences might not be aware of. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Fahim Rathor. I'm a graduate student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, and my question is about uh, Megyn Kelly, and I'm wondering if you have a sort of speculation what's going to happen to her for her career, considering the Roger Ailes saga and her relationship with Sean Hannity is getting a little testy, I'm just wondering what you thought about that. So I think we all know her contract is up sometime next year. <laughs> and um, I think, uh, you know, she's a tremendous uh, uh, news uh, anchor. And I think that she can do whatever she wants. And uh, um, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right over there. Uh, Jay Gleason. Um, at the start of the primaries last year, uh, one of your star announcers, Chris Como, uh, said about Hillary Clinton, uh, we, couldn't help, uh, we couldn't help her any more than we have. She's got just a free ride from the media. We're the biggest ones promoting her campaign. Uh, so even though you, know, you like to project a veneer of impartiality and uh, non-bias, isn't there really a, a, a strong underlying current of uh, implicit uh, favoritism uh, towards the Clinton campaign because she's so closely aligned and has been for so many years uh, with the political media and uh, cultural establishment and uh, their interests? More than Trump certainly is, who's much more in, unpredictable. So they talk about your favoritism towards Trump, but I think uh, you know the real bias is on the other side. From what Chris says, unless that's just his own uh, attitude. So uh, that that statement that you have recited there, which has been a popular uh, uh, talking point in uh, uh, conservative uh, uh, sites, is taken completely out of context is absolutely not what he said, and is wholly incorrect. So uh, he did not say that uh, in any respect. And uh, if you go and watch Chris Cuomo's coverage of both sides, I, I defy you to find anybody who's been tougher on both sides. So I understand, uh, I understand that it becomes a popular talking point to try to attack uh, Chris on that, and it is absolutely false. Uh, hi, thanks for coming. My name's Cornelia. I'm a second year student at the Kennedy School. Uh, you talked about CNN's decision to focus on the big story um, and, you know, uh, kind of smother it in your words. And I was wondering, you know, this sort of presupposes that there is always a big story, that that's sort yeah. of like it, it's an identity that already exists with right. this story. And certainly the examples you gave, like national security crises, right. things, there are examples of that. But I was wondering if you could talk about the power of a network like CNN to decide what that big story yeah. is um, on a day when there might not be like a huge crisis? So that's a really good question. So uh, uh, when there's not an obvious uh, big story is what you're saying. And you know, we really haven't faced this issue in about a year, okay? <laughs> so no, 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 it's, it, I actually have given this, I, I've been thinking about this a lot because we haven't, uh, you know, for the better part of a year now, we've known what the big story is by and large, right? Uh, and, and when it wasn't politics, it was because there actually was another big story, right? Um, so we're gonna face that, clearly. Uh, I think our philosophy on that has been, in those times, to focus in on the two or three, you know, it's not just one, stories that are um, of either more importance or more interest. Um, and, uh, you know, listen, I think, I think it is, it is our job to provide some editorial judgment on what you know the three big stories of the day are, and I think that's what we do. And you know, in certain circumstances, we can then highlight stories that uh, and give it some more attention than they otherwise would have gotten. But I think that comes down to our editorial judgment to say, hey, you know, here's the three stories we think should drive it today, and uh, and we use our best editorial judgment to do that. And that's what, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I like about the job 
is to try to identify what are the, what are the most important stories of the day. Um, but I think that is going to become a bigger issue for us in the months ahead. Thank you. If I can just ask a quick follow-up. Do you ever do things like look at Twitter or Facebook to see what you know, consumers seem to be thinking Never. is the biggest story? So our, our, our teams do. Our teams do. I never do. I'm not on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and if I use Twitter, I would get fired tomorrow. So. Thank you. Uh, good day. My name is Kanishk. I'm a freshman at the college. So uh, recently, Russia recalled its citizens, saying that there could be war if Clinton was elected. And uh, the Ethiopian government cut the internet. And the airstrikes in Aleppo have been intensified. But we don't really see a lot of this on mainstream media. So how do you decide the news value of an item? And secondly, while deciding the news value, do you see the, the possible impact a news piece could have on the citizens? Or do you just see whether it should be presented from a third party point of view, independently of the consequences a news piece could have? Uh, so I think that, you know, I think that we understand the consequences of our coverage uh, and we take that into account, but I don't think that we let that determine whether or not we're going to cover something. Um, whether or not we, um, you know, give full attention to, uh, uh, I, I like to say that we cover all, we, we try to cover all of the news. We have, you know, uh, and it's all on our digital platforms uh, and we have a domestic platform, we have an international platform, we have an Arabic platform, um, and so it's pretty safe bet that we are covering those stories. It may not just be, it, it, it may not be on every platform. Okay, thank you. Hi, yes, my name is Dia Sika. I'm a graduate student at the Harvard Business School. Um, my question is around, I know that a lot of people have said in recent years, news has become more and more sensationalized um, for the purpose of ratings. And at the end of the day, CNN is a business. So how do you reconcile the goal of selecting news stories in an unbiased manner with selecting something for ratings and essentially helping your bottom line? Yeah. So um, I guess i give you an example of something that, that we did this week. So um, on, uh, on Wednesday night, um, as the uh, allegations against Donald Trump were breaking in the New York Times, I think, they, I think that story broke at about 6.45 p.m., uh, as I recall. So um, that story broke and clearly became the big story of that night. At 9 o'clock that night, we had scheduled a, a one-hour documentary um, about educating girls around the world called We Will Rise. Um, and it was, it, it was an excellent documentary. It was going to run at 9 p.m. and midnight. And, um, you know, we knew that it was... Uh, it, it, it was about educating girls in, in Africa and the Middle East, okay? We knew that, you know, it wasn't going to have the same resonance as the fact that we could have stayed with these, this story that was breaking and was going to have, obviously, a dramatic impact and effect on the presidential race. And I could have decided to take that film documentary off and air at a different time. And we didn't do that. And, you know, I think that that was an example of balancing, uh, you know, what we knew was a big story that would get much higher ratings and was, was you know, obviously dramatically important to this election um, with also doing something that we thought was important and right. And so we do balance those things all the time. And, you know, I know that there is this uh, thought that we do everything for ratings, right? And, yes, we are running a business just as the Washington Post is running a business and, and uh, Politico is running a business and BuzzFeed is running a business. Yes, we're running a business and I've never hide, hid from that and I've never uh, pretended otherwise. But I also think we're running an incredibly important uh, 
uh, journalistic organization that matters not just to the United States, but to the world. And so we balance those things all the time. And uh, we may not get it right every time. Uh, different people can disagree with the decisions we make, and that's, that's okay too. But we do struggle with that all the time. And it's not just about the bottom line. It's about what's doing right all the time. When, we, when, when there's a big breaking news story, you know, we, we can go hours and hours without running a commercial. That's not in the bottom line interest of the company, but it's, in the but it's in the bottom line interest of doing what's right. And so we balance that all the time. Hi, my name is Maya Gottlieb. Um, my question is in a similar vein about editorial judgment. And my question is, you know, Trump is now a national figure. Say he loses the election, but next year he says, oh, I have, you know, I have a, I have proof, proof that Hillary Clinton is a man. Like, <laughs> would you give him attention if he said, oh, I'll come on your, your shows? If he has proof that Hillary Clinton's a man? <laughs> he says he has proof that Hillary Clinton's a man. <laughs> he says he has proof. Well, if he, he has proof of that, I'd like to see it. Right, but Obama... But we're not going to put him on him. just to say that. But if he's got proof, I, I, I'll be willing to look at it. <laughs> okay. Go, go ahead. I, I, no, no that's, that's, you know, how do you determine... When, did, like, when would you give him your attention? How do you determine that? How do you determine whether, when to give? Trump, specifically, your attention. You know, the birther comments and that kind of thing. Like. Well, look, I think that, I think that um, sunshine is the best antidote, right? I mean, I think, I think when you uh, give attention to things, it lets you decide what you think. You know, now, um, uh, you know, look, we, we, uh, we make editorial decisions every day, and it works on both sides, right? You know, we have new people coming out today to make allegations against Trump, right? And, and just like, you know, it works both ways. Before we put those on, we, we have to do our best to verify that as well, right? If he's got things he's saying, uh, it's important that we push back uh, if, if he's saying things that aren't true. You know, if you're talking about the birther comments, uh, if he or his surrogates say that, every time they say that, our reporters or anchors push back and say, that's not true. So, I mean, you know, it's- I mean, people have begun to do that more, but I feel like, as far as I can tell, they weren't doing that at the beginning, right? Uh, you know, listen, I, again, I, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I know that that's what, what certain people feel. Um, you know, again, I go back to the, the question Lois asked me early on. I mean, again, I think about some of these interviews when he made himself readily available uh, and he was being interviewed, he was being pushed back upon. Now, listen, I can't speak for, for outside of CNN, but I, I feel very good about the job that CNN did on pushing back on uh, some of the things that he said, uh, you know, and, and Berther being the... the, the the most prominent of those. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Richard Carey and an ALI fellow. Um, I was gonna ask you to comment on the speculation on the future of Donald Trump uh, potentially starting his own network, uh, you know, Bannon, Breitbart, Alt-Right, and so forth. Do you see that, and what do you see the viability of something like that? Uh, well, I mean, um, I don't know. I, I don't know, I mean, I know that speculation is out there. Um, I think it's harder to do than people uh, think it is. And um, so I, I'd say it's possible, but I would be, uh, I'd be surprised if that happened. But I don't know. If he loses, do you still cover him? You know, if he's well, still- Well, I think it's gonna, listen, again, I don't wanna presuppose too much, but right. I, I think part of this depends on what happens. Uh, you know, he, he is the Republican nominee for president. Uh, that doesn't change, and he's got you know 13 to 14 million people who voted for him, and he'll have many more of that who will vote for him in the general election. So it's 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 not like he uh, uh, hasn't been an important part of this political process, and part of it depends on what he does, what he says, and what he does uh, going forward. You know, so you know, listen, I, I don't think he disappears from uh, the scene if he doesn't win, but. I think a lot of that depends on what he decides to do. 
Uh, okay, we, I think we can take the people that are still standing and then that's it. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Ben Bolcher and I'm a Harvard alum. Uh, my question is about the economics of uh, CNN. Um, there's increasing technologies that allow you to skip commercials, uh, to either edit it out or circumvent it. Uh, and it's an important model right now. So what I'm wondering is, in the future, when this technology is much easier to skip through commercials, and in many of the live news events, you purposely do not air commercials because of, of the salience. So the question is, you know, as we go forward five, ten years from now, how do you still have a good economic model, even though mm -hmm. the commercial side is right. going to be even less? So, so uh, ten years is too long a horizon for me to, uh, to judge. But I would say, you know, just to understand uh, the economic model of CNN and cable television, uh, the preponderance of our uh, revenue comes from subscription fees and not from advertising. Uh, so, you know, uh, and the subscription fees are what people pay for their cable or satellite or telephone uh, access to CNN and other cable uh, channels. So that's the, that's the majority of our revenue. Which is not to say that we don't make money off of advertising that it, and that it's, it's unimportant, because clearly it is. Um, and, uh, um, you know, um, live news and live sports are probably the two things that are uh, uh, most immune to ad skipping. And so, you know, we're, we're in one of those businesses. So I think that CNN is probably in better position given our sub subscriber fees and the fact that it's live events um, than, than those networks that are gonna have to guard against what you're talking about. So I think we're here now. Sure. Uh, Austin Federa. I, so first off, let me say, I think CNN and specifically CNN International do a terrific job for a television network, especially in this day and age of covering stories and covering them in respectful, solid ways. That being said, the other uh, elephant in the room is Don Lemon. Is what? And Don Lemon. And Don Lemon is, is a figure that I, a famous profile calls him not the anchor America deserve, uh, needs, but the anchor America deserves. And I think a lot of the reputation about him is, is probably unwarranted. There's many moments like his, his comment in Ferguson that anyone familiar with broadcast news knows he was avoiding saying the word um, and a different word came out and it got him into a situation. But this is in some way a product of modern cable news. You, you, you would describe it an effort to keep watchers engaged and to keep them going. And part of that means the anchors are on for long stretches of time. You don't take commercials in breaking news situations and there's less pivoting than there used to be. And this is especially since you joined in 2013. How do you combat the problem of perception, right? There's this idea among people who do not watch CNN that Don Lemon is a certain kind of character. This is not only CNN, this is cable news, but especially going forward, how do you address that? How do you keep the good in it when this is becoming an issue that is getting throughout television media? Do you agree with that perception about Don? I don't know. I think that uh, if you watch highlight reels of any anchor who's been on TV long enough, you can find the exact same moments. I don't yeah. think it's specific to him, but for some reason it's become a perception that is more him than other anchors on television. Yeah. So, um, well, thank you for your, thank you, and obviously you know a lot about CNN, and, and so thank you for that. Um, I, I would say this. Um, I think, uh, and, and I understand uh, that, that there have been things said about Don. For those who don't know, Don anchors our, our evening program every night at 10 o'clock and does two hours uh, every night from 10 to 12. I think Don Lemon, um, does a fantastic job. And I think that, uh, and, um, and I think that uh, no one has, uh, no one at CNN, and I'll just speak for CNN right now, no one has grown more as an anchor and reporter at CNN in the last four years than Don Lemon. And I'm incredibly proud of Don Lemon, and I will sit here and say that uh, to everybody. I'm incredibly proud of the job that he's done. Um, I think that what you're referring to in some of the articles that have been written is, has he on occasion said some things that even Don regrets that saying? Yes. Okay? Yes. Um, 
And I don't think he's made those mistakes in the last two years. Uh, and that's because he, uh, he, has, he has really become uh, a terrific anchor and, uh, and, and journalist. He, he was already strong, but I think he's grown tremendously in the last few years. And he's aware of some of the things that, you know, maybe, maybe he wishes he hadn't said. Uh, and that I wish he hadn't said, um, and that's fair. But I'm incredibly proud of Don, and I think he's done a really good job. And you know, uh, I think it's really important that, uh, that news, cable news, news, and journalism have people and voices like Don Lemon uh, bringing the news. Uh, uh, and you know, I've made a lot of changes at CNN in the last four years. Putting Don Lemon in prime time is one of the things that I'm most proud of. All right, final question. Okay, um, my name is Toyosi Akirilia, and my question has nothing to do with Trump. Thank God. <laughs> no. Uh, I come from Nigeria. I'm a mid-career student here at the Candy School. Um, I know that you have three programs that focus on Africa at the moment: um, Inside Africa, CNN Africa Voices, and you know CNN Africa Startup. And then I know that specifically for Nigeria, you've had uh, Christian Porfoy, and then you currently have Errol Bonaire, who co cover Nigeria at the moment. And then your digital angle has Stephanie Busari, who's my friend. Who How do you me. know all this? Well, you, know, <laughs> you know everything about us. Well, because I'm, I'm extremely passionate about my country and Africa. Great. I just wanted to ask you if for any reason you would consider involving more Africans to manage our public narrative as a continent rather than have you know, foreigners come to cover Africa. I think you did a terrific job with you know, the bring back our girls issue. You probably know that two days ago, 21 girls right. out of the over, over 200 girls right. that were kidnapped by Boko Haram have just been released. Um, and then back home, we're a bit worried about how the West shapes our narrative right. for us and how most of the time, in fact, the complaint is, oh, every time something great happens in Africa, the West, you know, the Western media doesn't see it. But every time something bad happens, the Western media is the first to report it. Right. I don't quite agree because I think CNN has been very good to Nigeria where I come from. But maybe it's important to have more journalists locally who understand our contextual issues and challenges to be the ones reporting our stories, to be the ones to be able to engage with our local people in, uh, you know, in our own languages, rather than have Americans come and you know, report our stories from their own perspective. Because public narrative is one of the things we're talk taught here at the Kennedy School. And I think it goes a long way in how countries are perceived. Right. Foreign investment coming into our countries, uh, um, businesses wanting to leave or wanting to come is dependent hugely on how, you know, the powerful narrative that comes out of our countries. Well, I love, I, I, I love your passion and I love what you're saying and I love your love of, of Nigeria. And, you know, as you know, because your friend uh, is based there, uh, Stephanie, and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, we remain committed to covering Nigeria. We remain committed to covering the continent, uh, as you said in the three programs we have on CNNI uh, on a weekly basis. Um, with regard to more local uh, reporters and producers, I think that that's a, a, an interesting note and something that, that out of this I will, uh, uh, I will continue to talk to our international team about. We'll be grateful. We'd love thank, that. Thank you very thank much. You. All right, Jeff, I want, I want to give you... All right, I want to give you the last word. Is there anything we haven't asked you? No, no, you've asked me everything. Um, <laughs> Conan! Conan, uh, great, we spent another hour on that. Um, but, uh, no, look, I would just say, uh, one, uh, thank you. Uh, David, thank you for uh, asking me to come. And, you know, I, I think that this dialogue, I would just say, is great. I love it. And, uh, and I don't... Uh, I don't actually uh, object to anything that anybody has asked me here today because, uh, other than maybe one question, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, this is, this, is what, this is what the democracy and the political process is all about. And, uh, and I'm incredibly proud of CNN and the job that we've done. We don't get everything right, um, but I think we get most of it right. And, uh, 
uh, and I'm incredibly proud of the job we've done covering this election, and, uh, and I appreciate the, the back and forth on it. So thank you very much, and thank you for inviting thank me. You.